one of the academic program review forums to do some open sessions on some university issues. I'm not sure if anyone here was at that forum with that request. I was asked to consider one on, on the liberal role of liberal arts and also one on academic freedom. Does anyone recall that? Yes. So um, we're not going to be doing one at this time on academic freedom because it's in the discussions um, in the collective bargaining. But it was really important for me to show follow up to your requests. And so that is why we're doing this now. Um, and this forum also came about in the importance of thinking of the role of humanities and liberal arts in the context of today's world and to try to get a sense of what is happening in Canada, what's going on in other universities. So some key questions that we raised for Ken to kind of tackle or look at is what's the current role of liberal arts in today's universities? What should that role be? How does it dovetail with other disciplines? What benefits do they bring to our students? And how can we articulate and promote that? And what can and should we do to foster and promote liberal arts on campus but in society in general? And that's a really important push. And these are questions in which I have a, a very strong interest, not just as a university administrator or a faculty member, but someone also who majored in English and psychology. And I know how that has formed my character and the love of li lifelong learning that I've had. I want to give you a quote from Steve Case, was, who was a US businessman and co-founder of America Online, AOL. He said, a liberal arts education is very important, particularly in an uncertain, changing world. We know that that's what we're experiencing now, in particular in our university world, changing and many times uncertain. And I would argue that all of us need to think about what a university looks like today, what it needs to look like in the future, and the emphasis that liberal arts has had on our history, how it's such an important part of our university. And it's been part of the founding of Regina College more than a century ago. And so what I hope to see today is further discussion, not only by our moderator and by our speaker, but by all of you. Um, I also hope that we, in this discussion, will talk about some practical things, some ways we can, can really highlight the importance of liberal arts in society. Notes will be taken at this meeting and any follow-up we will keep track on and do so. And I hope we have a lively discussion and primarily because of our two uh, leaders today. Our primary speaker is Dr. Ken Coates of the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School and he's thought, written a lot about these issues. And our moderator, Dr. Kathleen Wall of the Department of English, one of our most distinguished faculty members. With that, I thank all of you for coming, and I will turn the mic over to Dr. Wall. Thank you. We are at a difficult historical moment. Governments and institutions around the world, from the European Union to the University of Saskatchewan, have recognized that we cannot continue to borrow against our future, and operate with heavy debt loads. At such moments when resources become scarce, the conversation about what we value, what is, is of crucial importance to us becomes quite passionate. That conversation is made more complicated by the social media, which allows us to hear a wonderful yet baffling variety of voices. In light of this historical context, let me drop two facts. On the one hand, between 1990 and the present, the number of liberal arts colleges in the United States has decreased 39%. This was likened in the Globe and Mail to a loss of biodiversity. We have fewer ways of framing the questions, much less searching out the answers to the issues that face us. On the other hand, in the collegiate learning assessment, according to Michael Beirube, the current president of the Modern Language Association. Students showed improvement in critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills over the first two years of university if they were required to read at least 40 pages a week and write at least 20 pages in a semester. It won't surprise most of us 
that liberal arts majors scored significantly better than other students. On the third hand, which makes me a Martian, but that's something you've long suspected, Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman talks about the fact that we simplify a very complex world in order to cope with it, coming to quick conclusions or drawing rapid assumptions, often based on little evidence. On a day-to-day -day basis, this system works well for us, but this approach does not serve our own best interests when we are attempting to find solutions to complex problems. This is precisely one of the virtues of a liberal arts education and of faculties of arts. Together we can, by listening and learning from one another, find reasonable solutions to the challenges that face us at a historical moment. Today we'll hear from Ken Coates for about 40 minutes, and then I will open it up to questions from the audience. Um, at about mm, 10 quarter after five, I'll suggest that we take our conversations outside. Ken Coates is Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation at the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy. Raised in the Yukon, he was educated at the University of Manitoba and UBC, graduating in 1994 with a PhD in Canadian history. His scholarly work covers a variety of fields from Northern history to Japan studies, Aboriginal rights to scientific and technological innovation. In recent years, he has commented extensively on the state of university education and research in Canada. Drawing on years of experience in the classroom, his first teaching job was at Langara Community College in 1980, and university administration as department head, dean, and vice president academic at universities from BC to New Brunswick, Ontario to New Zealand. Before returning to the University of Saskatchewan where he was previously dean, College of Arts and Science, he was the dean of arts at the University of Waterloo. He published Campus Confidential in 2011 with his longtime co-author, Bill Morrison. A revised edition is coming out in 2013. Ken and Bill are currently working on two books about universities. The first, a commentary for students and parents about university opportunities, and the second, about the global expansion of universities. Dr. Ken Coates, thank you. I became an artsman. Uh, my father was an engineer, and in our family, being educated meant doing something practical. Um, so she hasn't really quite got onto the fact that I do something practical um, as an historian and now a public policy person. I'm absolutely delighted to be invited here, delighted that you follow the student's path of filling the classroom from the back end uh, so that I feel like I'm talking into a bowling alley uh, rather than into a classroom, but that's all right. We'll, we'll, I've, I've got a loud voice and with a microphone can carry as far as, I, as, far as he possibly can. Um, this talk about the future of liberal arts in uh, global prospects for the humanities and social sciences I always find a really troubling conversation. Delighted to have it, delighted that you're having it. Hope it goes on for many months as you sort of go forward. But there's something really fundamentally painful about having your existence, your intellectual character challenged. And not by anybody personally, but by the system, by the government, by society, by the economy, whatever you talk about. We get this idea that somehow we've been doing the wrong thing. And every one of us in our own disciplines know that we are actually doing in many, some little part, the right thing. We're challenging our students. We're giving them sort of new perspectives. I've, I've struggled over the years to find the right metaphor for what, it, what a university education is about, and particularly one in the liberal arts. And I finally found one one time when I was sitting in an optometrist chair. Um, I hate going to the optometrist. Um, like virtually everybody here, we have bad eyes. And like everybody here, we actually live with our eyes. We rely on the ability to read, to see, for, for all of us. The thought of me losing my eyesight is just absolutely terrifying. And what happens is you sit in the optometrist's chair, and the very first thing that happens is he swings this enormous big machine in front of your face. 
And I panic at that moment because he already has obscured or she's obscured the things so you can't see very well. Do you know this experience, right? And this thing presses up against your face and you can't see and you're saying, so, click the damn things. You know, I don't want to feel this way. And so the person starts to click them and he goes click, click, and then she goes click, click, and you go click, click back and forth. And what I, what I sort of realized was that every single click was a university class. Every single one of those things either made the world clearer or muddier, right? Um, <clears throat> any philosophers in the room? The philosophy ones are the muddy ones, right? The, you know, the economics ones are the clear ones. That, at least that's how they all believe, right? So what happens is you go through this process of click, 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 entirely individualized. So what works for me doesn't work for you. What works for me doesn't work for you. But between us, this system actually brings the world into some clear view for us. That's what the humanities, social sciences, and fine arts do. They actually take a muddled, confusing world that you see as just a bunch of images and experiences waving back and forth. And through these classes and courses and experiences, you start to develop for yourself a way to explain and understand the world. And so here we are, just taking the comments of the moderator, defending something we really love. It sort of feels at this kind of a time when you're sitting here talking about, you know, it's like defending your child. My daughter's really good. She's really smart. She's really cute. Really this, really that, right? Um, and you say, well, why are you doing this? You can see that she's a good kid. And so for, I find this actually not because of this experience, but more generally across North America, the fact that we're actually having to defend what it is we do. So let me take you on a wild ramble around the world. I'm looking at a variety of aspects, positive and negative, of the historical experience of the academy and the liberal arts within the academy. Um, I don't really want to spend a lot of time telling you why it's important. I think you all know that. And in fact, what I hope I'm going to spend more time on is telling you what went wrong, because some things have gone wrong. There are some massive changes in society that are affecting us in interesting ways. And then toward the end, give you some suggestions on how we can reverse the pattern and actually take the liberal arts from increasingly being pushed to the margins of university systems and bring them right back into the center as much as we possibly can. So I don't want to defend the foundational importance of the humanities because humanities professors know that. You're exploring the character and foundations of societies and human relationships. I don't think I have to describe the startling impact of the social sciences. Um, if you just think of all the things we've discovered from psychology and sociology and from economics and religious studies and all these other social science disciplines, it's absolutely profound. Different ways in which we've understood the world as a consequence of the research and teaching that we do. We don't have to sort of explain again the, the, the power of the fine and performing arts, which I think not only explore the edges of experience, but create the edges of our experience in some really dynamic sort of ways. For many years, the liberal arts had huge followings off campus. My favorite example right now, if you've never met him, the man with the great hair, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell is actually from, he's from the Waterloo area. His father is a faculty member of the University of Waterloo, where I was before I met him a couple of times when we were there. Malcolm Gladwell talks to psychologists. He talks to psychologists all the time, and he gets their ideas, and he turns them into blinks, and he turns them into all these different books that he writes about, and tipping points, and what have you, and translates that scholarship, and finds a huge audience of people who are desperate to know how humanity works. And he's a wonderful interpreter on our behalf. But we also forget as we sit here defending the liberal arts and thinking about what the liberal arts could mean, of how much the liberal arts in all of the fields, humanities, social sciences, and fine arts, have actually driven societal change. And those of us who are my age and older will realize the profound impact that the, 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 the arts disciplines had society-wide and globally. You know, many of the major first issues about women's rights percolated up through the university system and sort of found voice in the academy. Aboriginal rights, very strongly supported in different academies, including the University of Regina over the years, moving out into society at large. Environmentalism had many of its early intellectual roots within the academy, as did you know, gay and lesbian rights. Anti-colonialism found intellectual voice, found substance, found argumentation inside the academy as we came up with a language and a vocabulary to explain what was going on in the world. If you move away from countries like Canada and the West who have been very privileged over more than a century and look at the new world, the developing world, 
you see the incredible importance of universities in independence movements. My wife teaches political science at the University of Saskatchewan. And she has this wonderful video that was done in the 1970s, 1980s, that actually just showed a bunch of student protests against sort of uh, um, uh, dim dictatorial governments in Korea. If you've ever seen those, those pictures, there are like 800,000 people mobbing onto the streets and moving toward government offices. University students who not only are protesting and actually standing up and being arrested and sadly being shot through dictatorial regimes. You think, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the spirit and the vitality in the liberal arts that shows people what was po possible for humanity, what was just for humanity, and what was fair for humanity. And if we look even now, this is the part I find really interesting. I was a dean, at, I've been a whole bunch of different jobs. I always tell people I just can't hold a job. But I've been at, at a bunch of different universities. And every single time I get there, I go with my job interview, and they say, well, we really want to know, you know, what role the liberal arts will have. The only time I didn't have this conversation was I was appointed as the founding vice president of academic at the University of Northern British Columbia. Right? And I got to define a university. In the very first instance, to hire the people to shape the departments and whatever. And we had the social science and humanities built into that university from the very core. But when I got to the University of Waterloo and they asked me that question at the, at the job interview, and I said, take a look at your enrollment data. You have lots of enrollments in the arts and art, art, social science, humanities, and fine arts. You have lots of graduates there. You have lots of applications, right? You have the highest number of art students in the world going on co-op education programs. Why are you asking me what's wrong with something? I'll tell you what's wrong. The funding in Waterloo was 40% lower than any other university in Ontario on a per-student basis for the Faculty of Arts and the Social Science and Humanities generally. And still, we were expected to explain what was going on. <coughs> so the relevance challenge. This is where it gets dirty. How do you explain the relevance challenge? The number of cartoons, I was actually going to, you know, I was putting this a very quick slideshow together last night. I was going through all these cartoons, and they were so nasty. You know, the one the boat says, you know, well, yes, I have an English degree. You know, you, do you want fries with your order? Um, I used to say when I got to Waterloo that engineering students said the same thing to arts graduates every morning, and that was, hi, boss. And I actually got a phone call from the university saying, we don't make jokes like that. He said, well, no, actually, it's a pretty good joke, and we should keep making it as long as we go. But the relevance challenge, you know, why do we have liberal arts degrees? Why are we doing this kind of stuff? You know, we don't ask that about engineering. Don't ask that about mathematics. The career potential of somebody with an undergraduate degree in physics is about the same as it is for somebody with a degree in history. The job opportunity is basically the same, right? Unemployment rates basically the same. Why, do we, why does one group, part of the academy, have to explain a whole bunch of defend itself year after year after year, and others do not? So I've got a simple test. <laughs> I actually came up with this test when I was at Waterloo again, sort of keep using Waterloo example. When I was, uh, uh, a man named Mike Lazaridis was our board chair. You may have heard of Mike Lazaridis, one of the co-founders of Research in Motion. And Mike Lazaridis was well known for thinking, wondering why Waterloo bothered with an arts faculty. Kind of hard to have your board chair having that kind of value system, but it's okay. So I sort of said to the, class, the group I was talking to, I said, well, here's a really simple test. You know, just pretend you've got a piece of paper in front of you. And on one side, I want you to write down the 10 things that you worry most about in the world. Just write down the 10 things that sort of keep you awake at night. And they're pretty standard things about, you know, why we can't get on top of the environment, the economic changes, economic globalization that's happening, political unrest, terrorism, racial conflict, religious conflict. You write all these 10 things down. Everybody has slightly different lists. And then when you're done, I want you to flip that paper over, and I want you on the other side to write down the 10 things that bring you joy. What really makes you happy as a human being? Well, we know what they are. It's music, and it's books, literature. Um, <coughs> it's it's theater, it's family, it's church, right? It's recreational activity, all these kinds of things, right? And you say, okay, now once you go down here, and I want you to cross off everything on your two lists that is not primarily studied by the social science and humanities people. Of course, nothing to cross off. Because it turns out the things we worry about, the things we really want solutions to, are actually social science and humanities issues. The things that really bring us joy and the things we want more of in life actually our social science and humanities issue. So at the end of the day, you say, what's the story? What's the question here? I mean, relevant? All we do is study the things people worry about the most and people love the most, and a bunch of other stuff in the middle. 
That should be a fairly much of a game stopper as it, as it goes. So this sadly um, is a fitch all too common at universities. Um, the research shows, by the way, that 50% of those students who have their computers on their desk are not engaged in the classroom discussion at all. Um, and if you want to have really good fun, if you don't already do this, is if you have a class like this every once in a while, just walk down the aisles and watch how many people slap their computers down really, really quickly. Um, and also get dismayed at the ones who don't turn off the movie they're watching uh, because they're in the middle of it, they don't want to interrupt it. So the liberal arts played a huge role in the transformation and emergence of, 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 of uh, the university in the age of mass education. We went from a situation uh, no, no, don't, don't go, don't, well, you don't, not quite yet. We went from a situation in the 1950s where universities were uh, almost exclusively male preserved, um, very limited attendance by people who are not of relatively middle class and professional background, to a situation by the time you get to the 1980s and 1990s where women are a majority of the people on campus. You think of the difference between the 1950s and even the 1960s, the ethnic minorities who were not part of the university community before. Aboriginal people, there were about 200, 300 Aboriginal people in Acadian universities in the 19, late 1960s. There's 30,000 in colleges and universities now. What a huge transformation. The new Canadians who were not part of our university world and now have become a major part of it. Rural students who never considered going to university as part of their life, who became a big part of the academy. And international students. The liberal arts were the primary point of access for all of these students as they came on, and the challenge of the university was to reflect their experience. And we were talking about this before. You remember when, when people actually thought the idea of studying women's literature was a radical thought? Some of you may have participated in those conversations. Well, why are we doing this? This is marginal, right? Now it's no longer marginal. It was a huge part of what was going on. There were not, unfortunately, as the university expanded, enough students to take up science, mathematics, and technology. The failings of our high school system meant that way too few students actually had the prerequisites for a lot of the programs that we wanted filled up. And the faculties of arts were basically charged with taking up the slack. Our entrance standards, we didn't have math. You want to reduce the enrollments in the faculty of arts, just increase the math requirement from grade 12, right? Or put another science as a requirement as well, and you'll see the numbers plummet even, even more. What happens as well? is that the government's very picked up on the fact that accessibility was the number one political priority. Governments very rarely talk about high quality university. They like to see universities do well in the grading rating systems, but they don't really talk too much about making sure that their, their, their place is accessible to talented students. They want places acceptable to all students. I was talking to folks in Northern Europe a while ago, one of the, one of the countries there. Government basically says they really want everybody to come in to the programs. So that universities are told to accept large numbers of students, but they don't exercise much control over how many they take on to second year. And this one technical program actually accepted 1,100 1, students in first year and 150 in second year. And basically just expected them to sort of disperse either to other programs or to other out, out university or outside. So arts programs were less accessible. They're more accessible and less expensive. Very, and the cheapest, the cheapest education in British Columbia, by the way, is at the University of British Columbia, the first year education, way cheaper than community colleges. So universities were expanding as well. So look at the transition that occurred, and people sort of in their mid-50s to older will perhaps remember this. In the early 1970s, arts programs were seen as sort of co-equal with basic sciences and engineering programs. You, if you were inclined toward literature or toward language, you went in one direction, or economics. If you were inclined toward technology, you went somewhere else. But there wasn't, there was about a, you know, bantering back and forth, but the, the challenge was pretty quite strong. We did have, by the way, default programs on campus. University I was at, UBC at the time, the default programs were physical education um, and education and also business. Business was not taught by people with PhDs. It was taught mostly by MBAs. It had, didn't really fit on the campus. We didn't see it as all that central. Um, so there are other places. So arts was sort of middle of the pack in terms of prestige and standing. Over time, I don't know if you follow these numbers, business school admissions have gone up very high in terms of the quality of students, the, the entrance requirement to get into business. For a number of years, kinesiology was one of the hardest programs to get into in the country. Education went from being a first-year entry program into a post-degree program with really high standing. Watching the students at different universities compete in to get into education programs is really quite formidable. 
So what happens is arts becomes the default. When students can't succeed in other programs, they shift over into an arts program. Go from business to arts, or from engineering to arts, or from mathematics uh, to arts. We then get into the other challenge that I think is really a harmful one for all of us, and that's the real battle over retention, where the pressure gets on students to agree on faculty and institutions to pass their students. Uh, at a university in New Zealand, sent a note around to their colleagues basically saying, please take extreme care um, in failing any international students. Each of those students brings $10,000 to our campus. If you fail 10, we'll have to lay off a faculty member. Not very nice, but that's a lot better, by the way, than or Cal State Northridge. The place, remember the earthquake hit there a number of years ago, Cal State Northridge? <coughs> they actually had a professor who was killed by a student who was enraged over a failing grade. Uh, so they sent her out a note saying, take real caution in giving out failing grades, you know, and protect yourself if somebody gets mad at you. The American environment, or well, what protect yourself meant is probably something you don't want to talk about too much. So what caused the fall? Um, and there is one. There is one. I mean, just in terms of, you, you've taught me about this before, uh, I mean, at the beginning of, you know, there has been a change, um, and a major change in a whole bunch of different ways. Number one, and there's no particular order to all of these, um, there's a shifting rationale for why people go to university. Studies done in the 1960s and 70s said that students wanted to learn about the world, that they wanted to discover themselves, they wanted to learn sort of how society operated, they wanted to make the world a better place. Well, now they want money. They learn to earn. Um, and universities feed into this like crazy. AUCC, go on their website, $1.3 million more if you make it a university degree. Come to university, make money. Guess what? Our students think if they come to university, they'll make money. That's kind of a simple sort of process. Turns out only to be partly true, but that's another issue as well. We also saw the phenomenal rise of business studies, campus after campus after campus, basically competing for the same students. Students who previously went and took a history degree or economics degree or a literature degree were now being encouraged by their parents and guidance counselors to go into a business program. Why? In North America, the average age of kids leaving home had crept up to 26 to 27 years. Parents who thought they were done at 18 were panic-stricken by the thought of another eight or nine years with their kids staying home and said, take something practical and get out of here. And so they did. The rise of professional programs took a lot of interest away, not just business programs, but also in health sciences and police studies and the kinds of things you've done here, sort of started to nibble away at the edges of arts programs. Some of them integrated with arts and some of them not. Back at the graduate level, where arts, position, arts faculties tended to stay very traditional to their disciplines, the interdis rise of interdisciplinary professional programs took over as well. We suffered through a striking decline in the, la in the interest in, in languages, a huge decline in the interest in languages. It's been a, a, a global phenomenon, I interestingly, to the point now where you probably already know this, but a lot of European universities are offering whole undergraduate degrees in English where you can actually go over and study. So they're competing for us for international students by saying, well, you can go to Germany and study in English. Go to Sweden, we'll study in English. Norway, we'll study in English. <clears throat> but the languages, which were always seen as a core element, I don't know if you've had this debate here on this campus, but we have this really interesting debate everywhere I've been about whether or not we should require students to take a language. I always would say, yes, we should, and we should require them to take it for four years so they actually deserve to develop some facility in the language as opposed to earning two credits in first-year German, right? We have an interesting thing in Saskatchewan where um, you actually have to take a language course, six credits before you graduate. Every student on campus has to, so the vast majority took an English course because that's what came out of high school and everything else. Our international students um, weren't particularly comfortable in English literature, sorry, as a, as a field of study. Um, so they started showing up in really large numbers in first year Cree. And they discovered that first year Cree was a much easier grade than Shakespeare, right? Much easier to work on basic vocabulary than to work on really interesting you know, literary concepts. And so I actually, when I was at Saskatchewan, had native students coming in and protesting against the international students in their class because this was supposed to be their place, which is kind of an intriguing sort of line. We were told about the number of liberal arts colleges that, are, that have declined. Uh, most of those are um, um, formerly religious-based institutions, mostly in middle America, suffered through depopulation. However, if you look at many of the best liberal arts schools, the absolute gold standard, the places where liberal arts are celebrated, where people are screaming the joys of literary analysis, they've now almost all got business programs. 
because they were not being able to get the students they wanted unless they actually put in more practical programs as they went forward. What else called the fall from grace? Um, there used to be something called the liberal arts bump. And the bump basically went like this. You graduated from university and you had a little bit of a struggle to get a job. Right? You got into the public service or into the private sector, you worked for a bank or whatever, but liberal arts graduates were well trained, they were creative, they were critical thinkers, they were good writers, good researchers, good analysts, and so over time they actually caught up. So yeah, you were a bit behind the engineer in the first couple of years, but by the time you got in your young early 40s, you'd actually caught up. And the liberal arts people did fine overall. By the time you got to the end of their career, the average salary was higher than that of many people in the applied sciences. It was a really good model. Well, recent research shows that that bump's gone. That, in fact, the arts graduates aren't catching up. And as people learn more about this, they say, whoa, I thought I was going there and I'm going to work into this career. It worked for my father. It worked for my mother. Why isn't it working, working for me? Our own research contributed to this problem as well. We turned from issues of looking at society at large and speaking to large audiences outside the academy to internal engagement. We started talking to the discipline and talking to theory as opposed to talking to the practicalities of the world at large. We gained a more complicated voice. The, the scholarly writing is far more sophisticated than it would have been in the 60s and 70s in terms of theoretical constructs and empirical methods and research methodologies and things of that sort. But we actually lost our audience. And another part of the whole process is we also discovered the problem of not having external advocates. It's really interesting. I've been in the provost chair a couple of times. It's absolutely fascinating watching the engineers or the accountants or somebody come in. So the chair of accounting would come in and say, oh, sorry, you have to give us two more jobs. So we haven't got any money for two more jobs. Well, no, sorry, the accountants association said you have to have two more jobs. I'm making this up, obviously. That you have, to, you have to change your program. You have to add more positions because the accounting accreditation process gives not only external validation, but actually sets the bar. You know? In case you haven't noticed, the University of Saskatchewan's medical school has been having some really interesting issues, in large part set by external accreditation that's passing judgment on our program. Right? When we do an external accreditation of the history department, we bring a couple other historians in, we tell them what we want them to say, they say, oh yeah, you can need more faculty positions, and the university ignores them. It's a fairly standard sort of process. So global realities. The reality, I, I would say, on a number of fronts. Let's just really run through a, a, a series of slides here just to go through this fairly quickly. Um, you know, you think University of Regina has been growing fast? Um, most of these are distance education universities, but I think three and a half million students is kind of an impressive number. Um, you get most of them involving South Asia and the Middle East, but huge growth in universities around the world. Over the last 25 years, the West has given away its educational advantage. We used to have a huge one. We used to have way more students. We had a better education system and what have you. We fairly systematically have seen that erode. As other countries sent more and more students to school, built better universities, improved the quality of their research, and we've actually grown very quickly. Um, just some really quick thoughts. We'll come back to the talk here again. Um, college tuition. This is American numbers, but look at the increase in college tuition relative to the computer price. Uh, computer uh, uh, price index, rapid increase in, in, in the cost of going to university. It's outrageous in the United States. Um, this is, again, American numbers to show you what's happened. Why the tuition? They always talk about why is tuition fees going up. You know, Amer ridiculous. The universities are getting so greedy. This is state appropriations. Uh, state spending on universities has been you know, ca you know, just, just absolutely catastrophic over the last few years. Um, this one is the one that you don't want your president to see, so make sure you cover your eyes as you go forward. Um, this is the average academic salaries, purchase pricing parity. Um, Saudi Arabia's first, Canada's second. Um, not bad. You know, people say, well, that can't be the case. How can America be so far behind us? America has a hugely differentiated system where some people get paid enormous salaries and people at religious colleges get paid $30,000 a year as a full professor, right? So yes, you can go make 450000 at Harvard, but you're going to make 30000 if you end up at a small, small liberal arts school I mean, somewhere in Phoenix or something like that. But we do rather well. So whatever happens in all of this, remember that you have just about the best jobs in the world. To be at a publicly funded university with the protections of academic freedom and the teaching loads and work expectations we have in Canada, we have just about the best academic jobs in the world. Um, but look at this one here. This is an interesting one. 
we're seeing a really series of fascinating developments that I think should start get you thinking a little bit. Um, King Abdullah University in, um, in, in Saudi Arabia, a $10 billion endowment. One person gave $10 billion. You know, we get excited at Acadia University with a $2 million grant. Wow, that's really great, right? We lived in the World Waterloo with Jim Balsley and Mike Lazaridis, you know, 100 million for this and 50 million for that. Oh, wow, this is really great. Well, 10 billion, 10 billion dollars, right? Entirely for sciences and technology. Entirely for sciences and technology. Absolutely huge transformations. So there's a time when we get really depressed about this. There's private universities in Malaysia. They set up a public university devoted to multimedia, computer design, animation, and a private guy came along and said, we need even more than that. So he built, a, the Jim Balsali of Malaysia built a, a wonderful private university on multimedia. It's now got operations in countries around the world. And with the, the idea basically is that, is that corporations and private donations turn universities very much toward a practical direction. There are some donors who come in and say, we really, really, really want to support the humanities and social sciences, but not very many. In fact, I think we're actually not very good at asking for money for the humanities and social sciences because we listen to ourselves rather than listen to what people want to do for us. But nonetheless, we see that sort of practical development coming. This one up top here is, uh, is Cyberport in Hong Kong. It's a development of university corporate partnership around digital media and digital content. It's a very interesting sort of you know, program and service. They say it's a real success. And so you all, there we go on the practicalities again. This one actually has a, a fine arts and social science humanities dimension to it, but it's all that practicality. Maybe you recognize these other ones. Does, does that one up there in the top right hand corner look like Yale University to you? That's Yale University in Singapore. It's hugely controversial one. This, uh, this is actually a plan. It's not actually built yet. Um, the Yale University wants to open up a campus in Singapore because Singapore wants the very best liberal arts undergraduate education they can possibly get. And Singapore is the ultimate practical place. They got lots of universities of technology and engineering schools and business schools. They do really well. They've got the National University of Singapore is just great. This one here is to bring the American liberal arts program in its entirety right into the middle of Singapore. Abu Dhabi. This is New York University. New York University actually has created a campus in Abu Dhabi to take the model and the concept of a liberal arts education smack into the middle of the liberal, uh, Middle East. If you look elsewhere in the Middle East, you see a lot of programs that are technically based and engineering based and what have you. Um, I shouldn't give your president any great ideas here, but in fact, the president of, that, of New York University flies over once a month and actually gives, teaches a class uh, over there as a way of uh, developing, supporting the, the program as it, as it sort of goes forward. <clears throat> so very impressive uh, developments as you see going forward. Um, transformations occurring, these are Nordic universities from the 1960s to 2010. Um, that sort of brownish red thing on the side is arts, humanities, and religion. You'll see that it went from 36% of all university students down to 16%. The green one, the green one here is actually social sciences, business, and law. In 1960s, it was mostly social sciences. If you go over here to 2010, it's gone from 18 to 26%, largely because of the growth of business education in Norway uh, or the Nordic countries over this time period. Um, you'll also see another sort of point. Um, Canada has one of the highest participation rates in the world. Uh, if you get over here on the left hand side, Canada is the second one in terms of the percentage of the population with a, a college and university education. Canada has a very extensive college program, but you'll see that the older people, 55 and above, are at the 40% level, but you have to 55% plus when you look at the younger population. Um, I will ask the very simple and obvious question, are there that many you know, high school students who are really likely to succeed at university? Uh, is there not a natural limit of people who have the intelligence, motivation, preparation, commitment, and work ethic to succeed at university? Um, that's not a conversation we're prepared to have in Canada. If you want my, my honest opinion, I think the answer is we have way too many students at university. We, have, we don't expect the students to be prepared sufficiently before they come, and we don't, we don't demand of them a really high work ethic. Um, not individually, we might do that in our classes, but collectively, we do not. Um, and I think we've made it too easy to get in, and now we're trying to make it too easy to get out. Um, arts education is supposed to be hard. I've never understood why people would accept, without debating the argument, that an engineering degree is any, e any more difficult than a German degree. 
to understand the German language, to be able to read the German literature, to debate and understand German culture in a sophisticated, important way is a really, really difficult thing. As is history, as is sociology, as is psychology, as is philosophy. But we sort of implicitly accept that argument as we go forward. This is an interesting situation to watch in China. The number of students actually taking the college entrance exams um, it's obviously numbered in the millions, and this is partly just the demographic changes that are taking place because the, the high school graduation population in China is declining. It's collapsing in Japan. It's falling very rapidly in certain parts of Canada, particularly Ontario and, and the Maritimes and, and Quebec. But you're getting in a really interesting situation here um, where we're having to take more students into the Chinese universities because the university system is expanding like crazy, um, but you're having fewer applicants. Uh, going in. I was at Nanjing University, maybe some of you have been there before, and was talking to the, the deans about their experience there, and Nanjing accepts 1% of the students who apply. They accept 1%. University of Waterloo, typically regarded as one of the best universities in Canada, do you think it's close to 1%? We accept 70%. We accepted 70% of the people who applied to that university. They didn't all come, obviously, right? But in Nanjing, it's 1% at their top universities. But China's got a problem. The other problem China has is about 30% of their university graduates are unemployed. They actually are having trouble finding jobs because they overproduced in that field as well. <coughs> this is India. Again, just give you these numbers, these staggering, staggering numbers of, of total enrollment and, and female enrollment as well. Massive increases in the number of students going to universities in India in large part because of a massive, massive increase in the number of institutions um, over this same time period. From 1970, 103 universities to 634. By the time you get to December uh, 2011, um, India is creating new institutions like crazy. A lot of them are private. There's real problems with quality control. Just because it's a university or college doesn't mean it's effective at what it does. Even bigger problems, by the way, in, in Africa with all of this. So, just to make sure we sort of cover some of the main points. I've got to stop soon as we go forward. Sorry about that. Um, I think we've got a couple of things I would just, just sort of suggest here. Um, the spread of mass education was tied to, I think, a misapprehension. Uh, I'm getting really tired of people talking about the knowledge economy with the impression that, in fact, a university degree is a guarantee of opportunity and a guarantee of economic, economic success. We actually have a specialist economy where people with very defined skills will do very well. Accountants do extremely well, right? Historians, I'm an historian, have real trouble in this day and age. We have about a 35% underemployment rate. Those are university graduates who have jobs, but they are way below what their skill levels are set. Second highest in the world until the economic collapse in Europe. And the only place higher than Canada was actually Spain, right? So we're overproducing the number of graduates for the economy that we have. But merrily, we stand up there and say, come to university, $1.3 million, and you'll, you'll do absolutely wonderfully well. We have a specialist economy, not a knowledge economy. When I hear Obama saying he wants 80% of all high school graduates to go to university, he is out of his mind. Dalton McGinty said exactly the same thing, by the way, and he was equally out of his mind. I mean, this is, this is a naive assumption about what the relationship between the economy and the university system is. I think that's a very important part. Um, so what are the challenges of the modern university and what is the future? So we do have a problem with career readiness, getting people ready for their experience after they graduate. We are under enormous pressure to get involved with community development and it's something the engineers understand and the nurses understand and it's something a business school can understand and it's something that's kind of hard for somebody who's a specialist in medieval history. The connections are not as obvious. The opportunities are not as clear as they go forward. We are supposed to have an innovation economy. At some point, we'll point out to government that innovation is the single biggest job killer in modern Canadian society. And we'll get less excited about innovation by itself as being a good thing. It's very good for corporate profits. Right? In the United States right now, basically, if you can replace a human being with a machine for $100,000, it's worth it. That's the, sort of the, the metric that they use in almost all manufacturing jobs. And the machines are getting cheaper all the time. It's very interesting to go forward. We also have to be very wary of what I think is the most dangerous phrase in the university system. And that phrase is, it's only academic. I wish we'd fight back every time somebody said that. Because the implication is, it's only academic, therefore it's not relevant, not important, not insightful, not valuable, not useful, not accurate, not reliable, wholly ideological, and defined by feminist theory. 
It, that phrase, we should, there's a declining interest. You should take a look at the, at the readership of scholarly articles, at how you know, all of you are working like crazy, you're writing more articles, your reading has gone like this. The number of articles academics read, the number of books academic read have been falling like crazy. The average American university student reads, or only 24% of American university students read a single book more than is assigned in their classes in an average 12 month period. One book more than assigned in their classes. And do you think they read the books assigned in their classes? No, they don't. Most university faculty have reduced their teaching or reading requirements by as much as 50 to 60% because they got tired of students not actually reading what they were actually handing out. And let's be clear, we have a problem with the current generation of young people. I, look to find, I, I've, I have five kids, they're my kids. I'm guilty, I'm sorry, I didn't do it on purpose. They are the most spoiled generation in human history. And guess what, they come out of a system where they've been told how wonderful they are. Their parents, basically modern parenting is about telling kids that are wonderful. It doesn't work so well with Asian Canadians, their parents pretty drive them pretty hard. Right? But generally, they're told how wonderful they are, how terrific they are. Their high school teachers are told to do that. So the high school is all about reaffirmation and all that kind of stuff. In Ontario, you, you basically can't give a person a zero as you can in Alberta. Um, if a student wants more time to write an exam, they can get more time to write an exam, and on it goes, on it goes, right? So we have a problem. We have brilliant students. The students, our best students, are just as bright as all of you, and just as bright as we were, and just as bright as the best students we've ever had. But when you keep basically letting in more and more and more students who are coming in for economic reasons, we have problems with preparedness, with interest, with reading levels and abilities, writing habits, work habits generally, and the most important, curiosity. One of the things the digital world has done is basically turn curiosity into a couple of keystrokes on Google. You don't have to know things because you can always find it out at the instant you want to know it. As one person described uh, the current generation, he, he described them as the dumbest generation. Uh, Don Tapscott over here, going out digital, says they're the smartest people ever and that IQ scores have been rising very dramatically. We're also facing declining or stagnant government support um, because I think we've reached the limits of public support for universities. I don't think this issue is ultimately about, about, uh, about, uh, um, uh, about the arts. I think it's about universities and about the perception of universities within society as a whole. California is now openly talking about how they can deliver a university degree for $10,000. You know, that's all it would cost a student, or that's all it would cost the system to deliver it to an individual. So what's the, what's the future? And I have gone on too far, so I'll try to make this fast. The trajectory is not favorable on a global scale. We have overbuilt the university system internationally. I'm convinced of that. Um, Vietnam has a 35% unemployment rate among university graduates. Uh, youth unemployment in, in Western Europe is 14 million young people. Now, it's not caused by universities. It's caused by a changing economy. Much of the employment crisis is caused by the changing economy. It's not that the students are bad or terrible. We've got problems. Um, we have to agree on standards and enforce them. Universities are notoriously lax at sort of backing off on putting great demands on top of students. I always say, and I mean this with respect, that students who come to a university like Saskatchewan or Regina or Waterloo or McGill or any place else have a chance to earn a great education. They're not required to have it. They're not guaranteed that they'll get it. But with the right motivation and cho choices of themselves, they could, in fact, have a great education. So what else can we do? We can start working across disciplines. Uh, Waterloo, one of the things we did that was very successful was, was basically take control of the discussion on digital media. Digital media will redefine uh, basically the operation of our modern economy. It's going to happen way faster than five and ten years down the road than we've seen to this point. You think social media is something now? Give it a few years, it's going to be something even greater. The issues are liberal arts issues of, of ethics and of psychology and of sociology and of economics. Arts faculty should grab digital media and make it their own. We have to rediscover the difficulty of making arts difficult. Doing arts properly. You do, arts is a difficult field. The most attractive program in Canada. If you had a 19-year-old daughter and she was ready to go off to university, you came to me and said, where's the best place? There's lots of places. I would say uh, Canadian universities generally are quite good. Right? But if you want a really rigorous program, McMaster's Arts and Science program. The epitome of a liberal arts education. Or the University of New Brunswick has a very similar sort of program. The two together, high standards, high expectations. Students rise to the challenge we give them. We have to embrace the idea that there are intellectually elite students and they deserve intellectually elite programs. 
At the same time, we have to realize that we are charged for reasons of finance and reasons of our mandate with government as a whole of bringing in a lot of students who are not here to study Beowulf any more than they're here to study Yukon history or any more than they're here to study microeconomics. They're here because their parents told them to come, government said they should do it, and they want to get ready for a career. We should not put those students in exactly the same programs and exactly the same classes as students who are basically bursting with curiosity and zeal for learning. We need to, I, I want my numbers, my numbers ho horribly generalization. 25% of our students are really super keen, highly motivated, and ready to learn. 25% of our students are, are remedial and need really basic instruction to get their skill level up to appropriate size. And 50% in the middle could do the work, but they're not very motivated. And we should take that 50% in the middle and offer programs specifically where they are. More career oriented, more practical, getting away from literary theory or historical methodologies and focusing on the skills they need to adjust to a rapidly changing, rapidly changing world. We need to rebuild bridges. Arts programs are not good, I'm not talking about here, at, at making connections to high schools and with employers. A number of years ago, they had a whole bunch of um, high tech people got together and said, we love the liberal arts. And they ran full page ads or half page ads in the Global Mail saying, please support the liberal arts. They're so getting concerned about pragmatism. And it was wonderful. I was the Dean of Arts in New Brunswick at the time. I thought, this is so nice. So there were 14 or 15 companies that put their names, CEOs said, you know, we have arts degrees and we're really proud of this. So I went to the websites of every one of those and looked at the job offers. Not one of them advertised for an arts graduate. We want a computer scientist. We want a marketing person with a background in business. They all wanted specialized skills. They want those students. They know it was good for them, but they weren't actually prepared to do it themselves. We need to relearn how to speak outside the academy. Go back to those relevance points, the things people worry about and the things people love. We need to refine our voice, not inside the academy. We're talking each other blue in the face. Let's reach out beyond the academy and tell everybody else what we know. Right now, one of the most fundamental issues, the Aboriginal one, absolutely critical, shows you all the work we can do, you can do with First Nations University and University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina. The fundamental issue that has people really upset and worried is religious conflict. What is actually going on in the Muslim world? If you look at the numbers, the numbers show there are more people who are self-declared fundamentalists in the United States than there are in Saudi Arabia. We don't tend to talk about that. We should be talking to people endlessly about what's going on in these religious conflicts. Mali. Mali is the next Afghanistan. It's happening right now. We should be having forums and writing op-ed pieces and maybe you're already doing this, telling everybody what's going on. What is that Islamic insurgency? What does it represent? And why is this seen as sort of almost like Vietnam in the 1960s as sort of one of these dominoes that's about to, about to go? We also need, if you look at Coursera, this is the sort of model of sort of open access, uh, massive online open universities. We have to actually, I, here's my other thought, I think the social science humanities are the ones that understand the world the best. What do we do? We actually understand how people think, how people operate, how they relate to each other, how the economy works, right? We should be the people telling the university how the university should change. We shouldn't wait for the president's office to come back and say we're going to do X and Y. So how many really creative ideas have you as a faculty brought forward to actually suggest to the president how the university should change? Not how you can protect English or protect history or protect economics, but how you can actually make the university have far greater impact on society as a whole. Explore new technologies. Do not let new technologies happen to you. We're way too, way too behind on this. Our students are finding our public lectures kind of boring. They're sitting here on their, their cell phones and their webs and by emailing social media back and forth. We need to actually figure out where the technology is going. We can reinvent the classroom if we do it properly. We can invent the whole university, reinvent the whole university experience. My final point, sorry for going on. I think we've lost our confidence. I know why the arts programs are good. I know why humanities, social sciences, fine arts are absolutely fundamental to the human condition, why they're fundamental to a thinking and enabled citizen, citizenry. We know why arts are valuable. But I think we've lost our confidence. We've had that relevance thing thrown in our face so many times that we've gotten defensive. And we're coming back and answering their questions one at a time. Well, I know somebody who's a CEO, so therefore the fact that we've got a 35% unemployment rate really shouldn't bother us because I know somebody who did well. We need to regain our confidence and basically blast our way back into the public confidence. 
creativity, insights, the understanding of human nature are absolutely fundamental resources for our modern, our modern society. I actually think personally that the arts discipline should be re-leading re the reinvention of the university. Universities in Canada and around the world are going to go through profound changes. We are going to face cuts in government funding, public support. We've got demographic crises we haven't anticipated properly. We've got employers who are upset with us. We're going to see some very innovative private sector responses to take away some of our best students. We've got groups like this, Coursera, that are basically looking and saying, how can we take, we don't care about 90% of your students. They only want the 10 best, the 10% of the best ones. Right? They're, they're going after the top students in those kinds of system. We're not on that path right now. Arts faculties around North America and around the world are defensive. You should see what they're doing in England, see what they're doing in Japan. They're sort of protecting their turf and worrying about it. I think it's time for the arts to be the arts, to be the humanists and the social scientists, the fine artists, to be the creative people that we are, to understand and articulate our vision for the world, and to make sure that we not only save our place within the university, we preserve what is important about the liberal arts, and in the process, bring the universities back to what they properly should be. Thank you. I think I could safely describe that as a scary pep talk. <laughs> There's a microphone here. We have some time for questions. Is there anyone who wants to pose one? Ah, Tom. Or a comp oh, conference would be like Regina. Um, so the why, I mean, I've been at this administrative thing for a long time. And the transformation in that period of time, my first administrative job was uh, in 1991. So I threw me in and out of administration for that period of time. The difference in public attitudes, the role get government attitudes is absolutely profound. In, in, in Queen's Park, in Ontario, the ministers used to hate it when university presidents arrived. Oh, geez, they're going to ask for more money, right? I go to Ottawa now, and they say, oh, not more university presidents, you know. And they sacrifice junior-level cabinet managers. You go talk to them, you know, because we're not so interested in talking to them anymore. Um, in Ontario, I haven't heard the conversation here. So they don't want to give money to universities because they just, just give it to faculty members. They either reduce the, the teaching loads or they, or they increase the salaries. I said, well, well, that's not what we want to do. You talk about accessibility and quality for education and giving faculty members $4,000 a year each more doesn't really help, they say, right? Um, but there's a lot of dissatisfaction among parents. Parents are terrified. The economy has been, you know, think of what happened to the economy. We're sitting in a boom right here right now, right? And Alberta and, and Saskatchewan, lots of jobs and what have you. But again, Ontario, where the manufacturing economy is going down, where small towns are sort of having a lot of their services evaporate. And, you know, there were a thousand lawyer, law, law students in, in um, Ontario who cannot find arguing positions right now. Right? So these are the best undergraduates who got into the good art law schools, and they can't even get that, that one leg up they need to become a professional lawyer. So parents are, they put a lot of faith in us. They put a lot of faith in us. Secondly, and this, I, I don't mean to talk, talk, tell any faculty member not to complain at any time they want to you. We're already good at this. We're good at criticizing our world. But you know, when we complain about the fact that our classes are too big and we have no time to talk to students, and what do you think people hear out there? They hear, gee, our students aren't being looked after properly. What do you think young people say about their university experience? Now, you know, I had a couple of good profs and can't remember their names. You know, I was in a big class. My daughter went to a, a big university in, in Ontario that I don't want to name, but they have a really bad hockey team there. And it uh, doesn't narrow it down much. Um, and, and uh, you know, she had, her average first year class was 350 students. Um, three of her five classes in her first semester were taught by, by um, first year PhD students. I said, like, what am I doing? Why, why is our family spending this much money so you can go there and be taught by graduate students in these massive big classes. So, and when we talk publicly about what we don't do well, you know, the class size is the sort of piece and what, class, class size is irrelevant, by the way, in terms of your real effectiveness, if you teach properly, right? There are really effective ways of working in large classes. So I think our, our undergraduate experience isn't great. Can you put you on the spot, but don't answer? 
because it's too complicated, right? But can you, as vice president of this university, guarantee that everybody walking across the stage to get a degree is literate in the English language? In Australia, in Australia, don't look at him, I've told him not to answer. In Australia, of the international students who graduated, they did a study and found that one third of the graduates were illiterate. And I'll tell you, I watch our students, it doesn't matter what university I've been at, and look and say, oh, I can't believe that kid's graduating. Right? Students are really skilled at language avoidance, at, at test avoidance. Oh, this person makes me write five essays a week. You know, This one over here does a multiple choice exam. One of my best students came in to see me the other day and was in another class and said, the professor told us the first day we all had 70%. And that the, the job was to earn more than 70% because they shouldn't be happy with that. Right? So our, we take our picadillos, we share it with the public because we think the public's really going to be care about whether we have 75 students or 80 students. We've, we've, done, we've got bad press and we've given it to ourselves, right? But watch that employment number. Every institution in the world has a ticking time bomb. And the one I think for us is the employment side. Uh, we're not connected up with the opportunities and we don't do enough to support them as they go forward. Well, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, think, I think you could actually reinvent yourself. Um, and reinvent yourself by, I, my, my view, if you actually take that middle 50% and give them the, the, the studies and programs and things they need instead of shoehorning them into existing disciplines, I think you'll do fine. Because then you'll actually do what you do well, right? Which is teach students and bring them up to a, an appropriate speed um, and actually get them connected up with the job market and get them thinking about their career opportunities right from the, before they even come to the university in the first place. I think if people are worried about careers and worried about job opportunities, then address it, right? Or else, the other side, you know, wow, I like intellectual elitism. You all have a handful of students that wouldn't you love to get your two or three best students in your class bundled together with ten other, you know, the two best students from ten other classes and have that as your class? Those students, my son was a very, very bright kid, um, unlike his father, and he, um, um, he just was frustrated beyond get out at University of Saskatchewan. In all these classes with students who wouldn't do their reading, didn't come to class prepared, left at the break, every day he'd come home fuming. I would have loved to have him get into a class where he was challenged and pushed and prodded as you go forward. What, what suggestions do you have for us to connect pragmatically with communities and do the kind of real interdisciplinary stuff that respects our disciplines? Because we can't do interdisciplinary stuff if we lose our disciplines, but at the same time connects with our communities. Okay, so I'll offend you mightily by telling you the disciplines are one of the biggest breaks on innovation in universities, and we'll leave that for another day to talk about, because disciplinary barriers and the way it works out in terms of allocation of resources and all that kind of stuff is a serious problem. I teach a course in social economy at Johnson Sayama Graduate School. We're in the middle of a class, exactly what you're describing. I think your comments are brilliant, literally brilliant. I mean, I don't think you should take over the whole university tomorrow, close down the business school, and set up a school of cooperative studies. You won't, you won't have enough students. But if you actually took what you're talking about, um, both as a research enterprise, as a public engagement enterprise, people are really interested in quality of life issues. People are really interested in wellness indicators and getting away from per capita allocations and, and wealth generation as being the only sign of whether we're a successful society. Who's going to lead that conversation? Right? So that's part on, on the outreach side. Have those conversations. Take them out inside. Do exactly what you just said. You know, I'll use an example in marketing. Um, my wife used to teach marketing at Bishop's University. And she, was, she asked me to come in and give a talk about marketing and not-for-profits. So I did some research. 30% of all marketers in North America work for not-for-profits. And how much coverage do you think they give in, not, in, in business school, in marketing programs for marketing? They're really good on ketchup. And they're really good on ladies' underwear. But they're not very good on cooperatives and on universities and on healthcare and all that kind of stuff, right? So I, I would say this. In your own market, you have to give people what they need here to sort of create the society you all want. But on a, on a broader scale, even, even my local market being Regina, Southern Saskatchewan, within the province and on the prairies, the question is how do you differentiate yourself, right? And you differentiate yourself by being a place you're known for something. So what's Waterloo known for? Co-ops. Biggest co-op program in the world, right? You know that innovation? 1957, right? That they've been having breakfast off an innovation that's you know, more than 50 years old. You could take everything you've talked about and turn it into a transformative element. It wouldn't dominate the university necessarily right off the bat. But articulate that and articulate back to the community. Make Saskatchewan proud for the numbers that you just shared. Build on the, on the value and passion for the co-op movement, which people still hold very dearly, right? 
And you know, sitting here and throwing darts at the, at, the, at the capitalist system is easy. Showing an alternative to the capitalist system is much more difficult. And what an enterprise for a university to engage in. I love it. Brilliant. Other questions? Yes, Dave. Chad's a good friend. I've known him for a long time. I hope he's right. I don't think he's wrong. Um, uh, it doesn't mean it has to be that way. Um, but I would tell you this. Um, if the humanities and social sciences persist with the definition of our research model, which includes both the projects we pick, the way we fund them, and the way we share our outreach and communications, it's not going to happen. If we actually found a completely different way to communicate. So for example, I think the monograph is dead. You know, we know, we, we can, I can tell you, Cambridge and University Press, the average number of books they publish is like 400 copies of a book. In a world that's massively larger with way more university libraries than ever before, and they publish 400 copies? This is an exercise in academic sort of self-promotion. You know, are we going to be the ones that actually trans take the blogosphere, take, take e-books and e-publications, work through Kindle and work through Kobo and find different ways of writing different kinds of books. We are brilliant at interpretive essays where we take all the stuff we know and all the tables we've got and all the graphs we've built and all the, all the models we've degenerated and we write a 150 page book that says we must have a cooperative revolution in Western Canada. You want to get people's attention, write something people will actually read. I hope Chad is right. I think it's actually up to us. I have talked about, to Chad about this many, many times. He's a brilliant guy. If you don't know Chad Gaffold, president of the Shirk, he's a terrific, terrific person. Great leader for Shirk. He's done an amazing job of helping us get forward. And basically, if we do not find a way to communicate so that the politicians and the bureaucrats are, are you know, sort of favorably disposed to the energy we're generating, we're going to have trouble. The standard argument, which I think you make very much at your folly as well, if it's, it's, it's the, the Harper Tories. You know, if they weren't there, we'd be getting a lot more money and a lot more freedom. The bureaucrats in Ottawa have been tired with us for a long time. I'm actually a Canada Research Chair. I went up there before, before I got one and was talking to them. They said, oh, geez, we're disappointed in that Canada Research Chairs program. We're not getting anywhere near the profile. We're not anywhere near the national changing ideas, the region changing you know, values and what have you. I think it is there. Put it a different way. Is the 21st century a time when we need the humanities and social sciences perhaps more than ever? Absolutely. Right? But are we prepared? Are you prepared? Put the president or the vice president on spot so don't answer again. Right? Change your tenure and promotion requirements. Get away from this stuff about whether you've got shirt grants and whether you've got scholarly publications in journals that have circulations of 150. You know, get away from publishing a new Cambridge University monograph that sells 400 copies. You know, I don't mean to dismiss that. We still need that root, ba that's, our, that's our basic science, right? But we need an applied humanities and social science. So the person who decides to work on blogs, the person who decides to work through digital media, who decides to work through videos and, and those kind of productions, right? That person should be every bit as valued within your society, I think. My wife says I'm supposed to say I think before every single sentence. Um, but I think if we did that, we could actually do exactly what Chad said. But if you persist, if we collectively persist with the very hidebound, discipline-based, you know, talk to, our, talk to ourselves model, not going to happen. Wonderful. They're great people, both of them. I'm going to exercise the moderator's prerogative and ask a question. Please do. You said two things that feel quite right to me and yet seem irreconcilable. One is that politicians are deeply interested in accessibility. The other is that we're taking in 25% more students than we should be. How do we reconcile that? So I was talking to a deputy minister of education, uh, post-secondary education a while back, and I was asked a very simple question. The question person said, our province needs more university graduates. Okay. And so he said, what, and, and we have no more money. This is, do these two things all go together? And I said, oh, I've got a model for you. I will guarantee you, I was in a senior position, I will guarantee you more graduates. He said, well, I said, well, we have no money. He said, it doesn't cost you a cent. I said, whoa, 
what, what are you going to do? I mean, how, it, he said, if you come up with a plan that will guarantee more and more graduates, won't cost me any more money, I'll go for it. And I said, let us cut enrollment by 25%. We'll take better students. We'll be more careful in who we select. We'll have 25. Guess what? Your class sizes just got smaller, right? If fewer sections of those classes trying to struggle to fill and get people who aren't quite ready to teach to teach those courses, right? If you did that, we'd actually get, we can't help our students enough. You know, you must feel this. You've got 150 students in, a, in here in a class, and they're writing a sociology paper, and you want to help the market. You haven't got time, right? Give us 25% fewer students. We'll guarantee you more graduates. And he just went white. And he said, don't ever mention that to the politicians. Because the reality is, politicians get pressured. They want Billy and Susie from Fifth Current to be able to go to university. Whether they're ready, whether they're able, whether they're motivated, curious, or talented enough is not an issue. If they want to go, we should let them go, right? So if government wants to say that, we should go back and say, OK, we're going to do that. But by the way, we're only going to let 65% go on to second year. So if you want our students to come here and try themselves, we'll do that. But only 65% go forward. And Ontario, huge push on retention. And everybody in the College of Arts, Faculty of Arts is saying retention. That means we have to fail fewer students, right? Theoretically, it also means we should help students do better, but actually just not failing them is easier than helping them do better. So those things seem really irreconcilable. Um, but in fact, I guarantee you the politicians are obsessed about accessibility. Well, see, this, this to me, this seems to me one of our, one of our root problems, yes. that, that inherent conflict. Yes. Um, other questions? Yes, Johnny. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think if you go back over the 1950s and 60s, just bringing women into the academy was transformative in terms of unleashing the intellectual potential of half of the population. So there's really, really good value in that. If you want to be worried about it, take a look at what's happening to working class Canadians, their participation in the universities going down. Um, your working class families uh, overestimate the cost of going to university and underestimate the potential career benefits of it. Because they, because they didn't go, right? Because the parents didn't go, they, they sort of push their kids basically go out and get a job driving taxi or something, you know, making, making that up. Uh, yep. Yep. And, and, and that's pretty wise if you look at the employment patterns coming out the other end, right? So in fact, with the accessibility push is that we're, we're actually becoming less diverse, kind of interestingly. Um, but it's showing up in odd ways in central Canada and British Columbia. Um, new Canadians are more likely to go to university than, than, than the domestic Canadians, right? Because their families come with such a huge push from South Asia or the Middle East to go on to the university system. Um, I just think we, I think when I say about accessibility, I'll use a very simple test. At the University of Waterloo, we wanted to find out if we were discriminating against students who were just below the bar. We were accepting students up to 77, 78, 80 percent. And we thought, well, there's some really good students at 75. You must go through this anguish, you know. You hear about somebody who's really motivated, and perhaps they work for the Model United Nations in their, in their school, but ended up with a bad mark in English, and so they're, they're, they're at 72 percent. 
So we put in a special category where we actually said, okay, you guys can come. You have to write a special essay saying why you want to be here and convince us that you belong. And we let them in and they almost all failed because it turns out that high school performance actually is a pretty good indicator, relative indicator of whether they're going to succeed. I personally, and maybe this is my experience in the Yukon, I think bringing students in to fail at university is unconscionable. When I went down to university, I think 10 of us went from Whitehorse down to UBC. Two of us lasted for eight months. Everybody else went home. And the impact of that on their whole careers and their lives was really quite profound. So I think we have an obligation to let people know if they're going to succeed. And if they still want to try, British Columbia, you have the community colleges. So can't get into UBC, go to a local community college, get some good grades, off you go. Right? I think you went by my number before when I said 25% really talented, 50% talented but not motivated. The 25% of remedial, I think we should put them in special programs, even a special campus. Some universities are doing that. Let them go somewhere else for a first year where they develop those basic skills. I want people to succeed at university. Letting the, the doors open and having people not, not succeed is a real challenge. Final comment on your, your last question about why governments um, uh, you know, are, are cutting their budgets. I've just been in conversations in Canada with so many different people over the last 15 years uh, to get a gauge of the frustration they have with universities generally. Um, yeah, it's, but, but, they, but I'll give you one example. Before, not the last Ontario election, but the one before, the uh, Council of Ontario Universities did a poll. They wanted to find out what parts of universities, you know, the public wanted to support so they could actually do some positioning and some electioneering and what have you. And they were devastated to see how low down on the scale the, the public ranked universities. It just basically didn't show up. You know, it was, it was ninth or tenth or something, which is way below the threshold of what the issues that would actually drive. And if you go back ten years before that, Universities were really prominent on the agenda. So I think politicians, if, if the public was really pushing for more funding for universities and stuff, we'd see a follow-up, but they're not. I think letting in students who aren't prepared is also really bad press. Yes. Yeah, that's true. One final question from a young man up there. Well, you know, a lot of those models have, you know, basically free tuition for, for university students, right? They let in a lot fewer, right? So I'll ask you the question, how many of your friends do you want not to be here, right? So, so in, 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 on balance, I mean, you, if the government has so much to spend, do you spend it on really high quality motivated students who are going to succeed academically? Or do you do what we do now, which is open the doors and let a lot of people in and see what works out? Every one of us has a story of a student who started off as a very weak student and four years later graduated at the top of their class. They were just enlivened by the university experience. They got a wonderful professor of economics who fired them up about the world, right? We all know those kind of cases, but statistically that doesn't happen often enough. Right? Statistically that is not the way it actually works. So um, we don't have a Nordic culture here. Um, we also, if you want to watch one interesting development, a large number of our wealthiest Canadians are sending their kids south of the border. Um, and that actually really hurts because those are people who, who uh, we want advocating for Canadian universities at home. But if their kids are at Harvard or their kids are at Yale or at Middlebury, they're not caring too much about what happens here at the University of Regina. You know, so I don't think we're ever going to go down that way in Canada. We could do far better things on our, our funding of students. Um, but, uh, but, but before we do that, take a look at how students use their university, their, their student loans. Um, a lot of the money goes to lifestyle. For some people, it absolutely pays the bills and pays the, you know, buys, the, buys the macaroni and cheese. But there's some really interesting questions that would have to be answered about how that funding is used. I think we could do a wonderfully different way of funding universities. Um, but that's not the approach we take right now. I wish we could. Thanks. I'd like to thank Dr. Coates for cheering us on. Our disciplines have been around since time out of mind. And it seems to me that we have the passion for those ideas that we engage in every day and the students that we talk to. We have the kind of complex worldview that is needed at this particular historic moment. And I think we can do this. Have a great day. Thank you.